Good evening from the Capitol Building in Charleston. I'm Suzanne Higgins. At the legislature today, the House's foster care bill was up for a vote in the Senate, and the Senate's Intermediate Court of Appeals bill was up for a vote in the House. Joining me to talk about that and more are Brad McElhaney of West Virginia Metro News, Taylor Stuck of the Huntington Herald Dispatch, and Phil Kabler of the Charleston Gazette Mail. Thank you all for being here. Um, Taylor, let's start with you. Uh, in the Senate, House Bill 4092, this is the very large foster care bill. It uh, attempts to do many things. It was on third reading today with the right to amend. Um, in a moment, we're going to hear Senator uh, Charles Trump, the judici Judiciary Chair, explain um, a, a strike and insert amendment, uh, the, the Senate's version. He called it a synthesis of the Finance and Judiciary Committee. But bring us up to date on, on the, the journey of that, the House bill in the Senate, say, over the last week. Right. So it started in Judiciary Committee. It came over from the House. Um, and the big thing that changed in there was the funding. Mm -hmm. So as it came over, the Senate took out the funding mechanism that the, the House had provided, which just raised the base reimbursement rate for foster parents and they changed the strategies and kind of left it a little more open-ended for DHHR to implement policies and they want a tiered system and to kind of change how, you know, if you take a harder to place child, like a, like a teenager, um, you would get some more money. Um, so, and it was $4 million to kind of work with that system. Um, they had also changed a little bit of the, the Bill of Rights and cleaned up some things. Um, it cleaned up the guardian ad litem part, um, allowing it to, giving the Supreme Court back the, the authority that they, they should have. Um, and then it moved on to the Finance Committee and they raised the money a little bit more, gave 900000 900, more dollars towards that, those strategies. Um, and it reached the floor yesterday and they, had a bunch of amendments. The Democrats wanted to add back in that funding mechanism from the House. They weren't happy about it. Um, and so there, it was, there was a big difference in the, in the amount of money in correct. both bills. The House was 16.9, and as you said, just as of yesterday, it was under $5 million, the, the Senate. Right. Well, let's listen now to what uh, the Senator Trump, again, uh, Judiciary Ch Chairman, explained was in the Senate's version, a very big change just overnight. Um, he said the Senate wanted to emphasize five different areas. Let's take a listen. The Senate version of this uh, rearranges those priorities a bit. It emphasizes five things that are listed in Section 111C. So that section says, subject to appropriations by the legislature, the department is authorized and directed to do the following. One, enhance and increase efforts to provide services to prevent the removal of children from their homes. It's really important. West Virginia has the highest rate in America of children being removed from their homes. Now we all know part of that is driven by an opiate crisis we have in this state. Uh, there are other factors that drive it, but we should be working to drive that down. And this is a critical piece that I think the Senate uh, position on this, a little different from the House, or at least in emphasis, to, to require the department to take, make efforts to uh, provide services to prevent the removal of children, services to families in their home. Two, Identify relatives and fictive kin of the children in need of placement outside the home. So instead of an, uh, putting children into an expensive foster care system, uh, we have to do more than we've done to look for relatives, family members, coaches, teachers, preachers. Instead of an expensive, formalized stranger system, which is what we operate now, uh, and, you know, we have to operate it. We have to provide homes for the children who are in the custody of the state. But this directs the department to emphasize looking for family members who can do it. Three, train kinship parents to become certified foster parents. It's really important. And there are grandparents, aunts, uncles, people who are willing to do it, but it's hard to do. That training is largely done by child placement agencies now what we're asking the department to do is uh, 
focus some uh, extra money, attention, and effort on training up uh, the family members who step forward and are willing to take a child who's in a crisis situation. Uh, I got to meet just this morning with a, a lady who traveled here from Tucker County to talk to us about this bill. She has five of her grandchildren with her. I think probably some of my colleagues, Mr. President, got to meet her as well. Uh, she's taking care of five of her grandchildren. She's been trying to get certified since November. Since November, and the process has taken too long, Mr. President, so we need to bolster that. Okay, number four in the Senate list of priorities, and this is really important, expand a tiered foster care system that provides higher payments for foster parents providing care to and child placing agencies providing services to foster children who have severe emotional, behavioral, intellectual problems or disabilities with particular emphasis upon removing children in congregate care and placing them with suitable foster families. And number five is a, to develop a, a pilot program to increase payment to uncertified kinship parents um, for, excuse me, uh, places for, for the purpose of further uh, helping families who have accepted kinship placements. So one of the things we learned in the course of this is if you, are, if you take a grandchild or a niece and you're not certified, all you're eligible for, you're not eligible for anything. The child is eligible for a TANF benefit of $294 a month, and that's inadequate. That's just completely inadequate. And we have, we have grandparents and relatives all over the state who stepped into the breach and are taking care of children who otherwise wouldn't have a home. And we need to provide some financial support to those people who need it. And so, Taylor, we were expecting uh, multiple amendments. Uh, we have spoken with some of the, um, the minority uh, senators, the, the Democrat senators, and they were lining up with all kinds of amendments. Um, so this was really a surprise. There were, few very, there were two very small um, cleanup kind of amendments offered, and those were both uh, supported and passed. Uh, so, so what happened? Um, well, Senator Blair, um, the Finance Committee Chair, said that he got, and I'm not sure if it happened overnight or if it happened this morning, got a new, I think, general revenue projection um, for the future that had $20 million more million than they had originally been planning on. So that allows them the ability to add back in the $16.9 million that the House originally came over. So this was a bipartisan amendment. Everybody in the Senate. 34 people 34. Signed That's Put extraordinary. It, it yeah, went from yesterday. It went from yesterday where Democrats were pretty frustrated, visibly mm -hmm. frustrated, um, that they were felt like they were being sh kind of shut out, um, to t this morning where everyone was on the same page and giving the the, the funding to to do everything too. And that's the other thing. It doesn't take away the tiered system. The, the tiers are still in there. Um, but this money will be able to still raise the base funding a little bit. Um, I think he said maybe like six dollars a month, which still adds up to can be make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where we, we landed. Money, well, falling, money falling from the sky makes things so much easier, doesn't it? And, and, and again, it was it, they adjusted the revenue estimates for next year in order to do this. They didn't go in and take the money from the Supreme Court or <laughs> anywhere else. Rich Moore used to do. If he needed a hundred million for a project, he increased the revenue estimated by a hundred million, whether the money was there or not. Although, remember that uh, we were carrying over about 16 million that was not appropriated in the current budget, so that's available. I don't know if that's part of the 20 million or not, but there's, there's always money laying around here and there at the Capitol. Well, there was, you know, uh, Good spirit felt by all uh, in the in the Senate this morning. So let's go ahead and, and listen to some of those remarks that were made right before uh, the vote, which was uh, 34 to nothing, uh, unanimous vote in favor of this bill. Uh, first, we'll hear from Senator Roland Roberts, Republican of Raleigh County, then Senator Michael 
uh, Moroni, Republican of Marshall County, Senator Ron Stallings, Democrat of Boone County, and then Finance Chair Senator Craig Blair, Republican of Berkeley County. We've done something very good here. It's, an, it's such a great necessity. It's been many years in coming. And in West Virginia history, the 84th legislature will go down as being a time when everybody came together. It's been rather challenging, and it's been rather heart-wrenching, has it not? But uh, we are all able to present something that we're very proud of. And I look forward to, when we get into the 85th legislature, that we begin now to assess what we've done in the last couple of years and uh, what we can do even better in the future. Mr. President, the kids in foster care in West Virginia have a tough start to life. <clears throat> we owe it to these kids to do the best we possibly can for them. They need it and they deserve it. Mr. President, I would like to personally thank you for the money invested in these kids. Thank you, Mr. President. You made it happen. Are the changes to the foster care system perfect, Mr. President? Probably not. But are foster kids in West Virginia better off today than they were last year in prior years? Yes, they are. This bill goes further. This, this hasn't gotten a lot of print or a lot of talk. But when we talk about our supervised group setting, where youth 16 to 21 years of age can live that would live with staff on site that can be transitioned from foster care into the real world. Also, this bill has scattered site living arrangements, which means a living arrangement where youth 16 to 26 live in a setting that allows the staff to be available as needed. So in addition to helping fix the system, we're going further than that and actually helping the transition from foster care into adulthood. The one goal that we're hoping to do more than anything is to be able to take care of these children and hopefully that we can, other work that we do in this body will make it so that we can reduce the number of children that actually end up into the foster care system. Uh, that is the disease. This is just a treatment for the symptom that's out there. We must solve the disease, and that's putting people back to work in West Virginia so they can have a successful family life and they don't get into these situations with drugs and things like that. And so is there a sense that the House will accept these changes? Yeah, I, I think the, so. the, the person pushing most for the, the House's structure for the finances was Delegate Jeffrey Pack. Uh, vice mm -hmm. Chairman of the Health Committee, Republican from Raleigh County, and he immediately tweeted a thank you at, at the Senate to say, glad we're getting this done. So I, I think there are some minor changes, but I, yeah. I think there's every indication it'll pass. All right. They don't well, want to go I, home and say they didn't do it. Yeah. Pack also liked the tiered system as well. He thought it was a good idea, and he just thought it, there would be a way to do both things, raise the base and do the tears, and that's what the Senate did. All right, well, we might see it quietly just accepted tomorrow then. Um, at the same time that the, the action on this major bill was happening, the Intermediate Court of Appeals bill was, uh, was up in the House. Uh, Brad, tell us how that went. Well, there, there was multitasking by several of us here. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was hard, yeah. <laughs> it was hard. Thank goodness for the miracle of streaming. Uh, but so this Intermediate Court of Appeals bill, if you want the long history, uh, was recommended in 2009 as part of a task force set up by then Governor Joe Manchin. Uh, it was bipartisan. Uh, since then, the Senate majority has really wanted to do it, has uh, passed this, what, three or four years in a row? Mm -hmm. Three, I think. Um, their view is that this mid-level court system would establish a standard of review so that if there were some jackpot judgment at the local court level, uh, it, it would provide reassurance to businesses. Uh, but the House hasn't been interested. They've, they've gone home basically without taking it up several years in a row. Um, Senator, uh, Senate Judiciary Chairman Charles Trump went so far as to testify multiple times in a uh, public hearing on the House side this year, testified in committee. They really put the push on. So it got so far as a floor vote today, a passage or not passage vote, uh, argued about it for a while and 
it was either up or down, and after all that, it was down. It was down. Uh, let's listen to some of these arguments for and against. Uh, first, we'll hear Majority Leader Amy Summers, Republican of Taylor County, then Delegate uh, Chad Lovejoy, Democrat of Cabell County, then Delegate Moore Capita, Republican of Kanawha County, and then finally, Minority Leader Tim Miley, Democrat of Harrison County. Every one of our constituents deserves to have access to justice. Every single person deserves to have a right of appeal. How do you get that in West Virginia? You hope the Supreme Court takes it up and then maybe issue some memo, memorandum decision, whatever the right word is in, in, the, uh, in the court system. It surprises me when we talk about we can't do this because it costs too much money, but we voted so easily green to provide $11 million in dental care but we don't want to provide a potential $8 million three, down, three years down the road from now for people so that they have a chance to have their appeals heard, to be even the right to appeal. Look at the evidence. This is a body that deliberates. This is a body that works things in committees, that has witnesses and facts, and look at them. And I promise you that if you ask yourself this question, looking at the evidence, should we today vote to expand state government by creating a whole new court, more judges, more staff, and millions of dollars of cost when our caseload is a fraction of what it once was, your answer will be no. We're the keepers of the purse. That's our duty. This bill has no budget implication at all this year. It has no budget implication at all next year and it has a six month implication the year after we've provided ourselves time to evaluate this I think this is a very serious step and whether or not your your constituents call you and say we we really need intermediate court appeal. nobody's called me and said that either but one of the responsibilities of this body and this government is to ensure that we have a structurally sound government it's not sexy but we have to be the housekeepers of our own building here. When the day and time comes that this is needed, we ought to implement it. I don't think that day and time is now, and I don't see it in the foreseeable future. I think we know, I think we know very clearly why businesses aren't coming to West Virginia. They all say we need a qualified and educated workforce. So to the extent people have stood up and said, this is a, a job creator, I, don't, I just don't think it is. I mean, no one really expects to get sued and have to assess the number of levels of appeals. And so those who supported this were largely Republicans, but there were some Republicans that, that voted against it, and that's why it did, did go down. Right, I mean, even though they're all Republicans, there are different philosophies, mm -hmm. and some are um, more associated with business growth in the interest of business, others would consider themselves to be uh, guarding against government growth or guarding against additional expenditures of government. And so those two elements within the Republican Party clashed, uh, which meant that alongside Democrats there were enough votes to kill this entire thing, and in fact to kill it twice, uh, because, do you have a clip of this? Um, Minority Leader Miley, yeah, as no, soon as the know. vote was taken, uh, moved to reconsider it. And he didn't actually want to reconsider it. Uh, he wanted to play that card to lay it down and vote the bill right. down it's again. So strictly that procedural moves because a bill can only be reconsidered once. So if it failed, it was dead for the session. Yeah, I think it was one of those interesting uh, coalitions, and we've seen it a couple of times before in the House, where you get the far right Republicans who are against any growth of government at all. Uh, joining the Democrats to oppose the bill as they did today. So they, they say politics makes for strange bedfellows. That was certainly a case today, and, and it's happened a couple of times before in the past. Um, well, Phil, it, it was a, a uh, priority of Senate Republicans. And right. this is not, I mean, this is one of a couple major pieces that Senate Republicans wanted this session and didn't get. Yeah, I was tweeting that in my 31 years, I can't remember a s session where Republican leadership had so many 
defeat so many major bills crash and burn. You had the, the court today, which was arguably the centerpiece of their agenda. You had the inventory tax on manufacturers, which was, if not the centerpiece, then the second uh, key issue they wanted. That, of course, crashed and burned. And then you had early in the session the bill to decouple Greyhound racing from the two uh, uh, casino racetracks in the state, which would have freed up about $17 million that now goes to uh, supplement purses that would have been freed up for general revenue. So you've had in succession these three key bills all crash and burn. It's it's uh, almost unheard of in, from my memory. It, it is. However, they have had a lot of wins, obviously. Uh, um, how, how would you describe or what are some of the, the, the highlights of this session as we look back over 59 days. Well, you know, the, the most recent one is the foster care bill, and mm -hmm. um, th there seems to be a, a pleased reaction in the House of Delegates where uh, delegates spent much of the session on that bill and passed it through three committees. Uh, but now the Senate, which most recently passed it, uh, joining them in, in the pleasure and, and being able to say, we passed that bill. Uh, Speaker Hanshaw's investment, investment fund bill fund. that was in particular, his top priority uh, also passed both both houses now. Uh, so that's another thing that they can look to and say, look at what we did. And, and also we know that uh, business and industry certainly got uh, their fair share of supportive legislation this session. Yeah, quite a few tax breaks, uh, but also a, a solar bill that mm -hmm. a few years ago you might not have expected coming out of this legislature. It didn't pass without argument, but it passed. And then um, several uh, justice reform bills. We know that the, the House Judiciary Chair made that his priority this year. All right. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, uh, we want to thank all of you for, for joining us throughout this session. Um, we've really uh, appreciated your participation. Brad McElhenney of West Virginia Metro News. Taylor Stuck of the Huntington Herald Dispatch, and Phil Kabler of the Char Kapler of the Charleston Gazette Mail. Thank you all for being here. We've appreciated it. Thank Thanks. You. A small army clad in red have been seen here at the Capitol throughout the session. Randy Yowie talked to several AARP volunteers about lobbying for their membership. Gathering in the Capitol cafeteria for daily strategy meetings a group of retired or semi-retired, geographically diverse volunteers who work to help shape legislation favorable to their fellow senior citizens. For WVAARP, that's nearly 300,000 West Virginians aged 50 and over. They're engaged and they're intelligent, they're well-read, well-spoken, um, and uh, again, quite energetic. Irvin Scarberry from Huntington has 15 years of AARP legislative session work under his belt. Irvin's reasons for volunteering mirror his colleagues' passions for service. My personal philosophy of life is that we're here to serve others. And the best way for me to serve others is to come here and volunteer for my senior friends. Princeton's Ann Pauley says her faith leads her to serve. Working with AARP, that means faithfully getting down to legislative detail. We're told what the bill numbers are, we're told um, what to watch for, why it's of importance to people across the state, why AARP uh, is on board behind it or not behind it. Doctors with the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine have joined in AARP's quest for elderly wellness. With many rural West Virginia seniors challenged to simply reach distant health care access, many clinics are increasing their rural outreach. They will actually go to senior centers that are in smaller communities and provide some nutritional counseling. Hopefully they'll have some nurses that can go with them and offer them flu shots. Volunteers attend floor sessions and committee meetings. Their key AARP issues include fighting elder abuse and fraud, strengthening home care services, supporting family caregivers, and lowering prescription drug prices. They're having to decide between paying their utility bill and purchasing a prescription that their doctor has prescribed to keep them healthy. We're not going to help people become healthier 
until we get medications under control so that they can afford to take them as we as physicians prescribe for them. So these red clad volunteers align with the national AARP mission to empower people to choose how they live as they age. I'm Randy Yoey for the Legislature Today. Tomorrow, West Virginia Public Broadcasting will broadcast live from the Capitol the final four hours of the 2020 legislative session. We'll begin our broadcast at 8 p.m. following both House and Senate floor action. We'll have interviews with lawmakers and review the major bills of the session. We hope you'll tune in. I'm Suzanne Higgins. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Hello, I'm Chuck Roberts with Vasilia Scoris, and we want to thank you for making West Virginia.